Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's do this. You're in charge, huh? Yeah, and the second and thirds and all the rest of the stuff. All right, let's get our agenda. Through the system, though, like through a web portal, not even not even emailing you the documents. Right now, we're just doing it. Okay. All right, everyone. Let's call the uh, January fifteenth meeting. Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency governing and implementation boards together. We have um, Kat Tucker, the governing chair, is out sick. Uh, Peter Leroy, Mu Leroy Munoz, um, her alternate, is also ill. And we have Councilman Roland Velasco, the alternate, uh, sitting in with us today. Welcome, Roland. And um, we'll start the meeting. We don't have a quorum until Rose Herrera gets here from San Jose. We understand she's en route. She's the only other person that we expect, which will give us a quorum for both boards. Both boards, yes. For both boards, which, which will be great. So we can take non-action items. And Valerie, it's a new year. Why don't you just start us off on the end with introductions going around once you're starting with yourself. Certainly. I'm Valerie Armento, the General Counsel of the Habitat Agency. Edmund Sullivan. You're not on. Edmund Sullivan, uh, Executive Officer, Habitat Agency. Jason Rogers, Division Manager for Environmental Review and Development Review for the City of San Jose. And member of the Implementation Board. Andrew Crabtree of Community Development Director for Morgan Hill and the Implementation Board Alternate. Uh, Mike Wasserman, Santa Clara County Supervisor, District 1, Implementation and Governing Board. Uh, Steve Tate, Mayor of Morgan Hill, uh, Governing Board only. Roland Velasco, City of Gilroy, Governing and Implementation Board Alternate. Linda Lazat, Implementation Board, Santa Clara Valley Water District. Uh, Tom Fitzwater, Environmental Programs and Resource Management Manager for VTA and Implementation Board member. County Supervisor Joe Simitti and member of the Governing Board. Thank you. All right, thank you. And on the um, on your agendas, item one will take action, so we'll defer that one. Item two, mid-year budget review briefing. I'm going to... Yeah, we, we that's... That's just accepting a report, recommended action, so we can do that. Great. And Edward, I think that's you. Yes, thank you. So um, just part of the requirement of the agency is sort of to go through a mid-year budget review, which is standard practice with a lot of uh, public agencies. And uh, this, um, this briefing is just sort of to inform the governing board action and to, uh, to sort of let the uh, implementation board aware of where we are with the budget. So well, uh, the revenues to date are $2,773,264. Uh, the revenue sources are noted in the staff report. They come from land cover fees, uh, wetland fees, nitrogen, burling owl, and uh, serpentine. Uh, to date, we haven't collected any uh, serpentine fees, but we anticipate that we'll collect a million in serpentine fees by the end of the year. Uh, page 14 of your packet goes over um, sort of the projected revenues and um, anticipated revenues. And I'll go through all these um, line, line by line. So the, the land cover fees were projected in June of last year to be around six million dollars. We anticipate them to be 3.7 million. That's based on development activity that we anticipate. So, so we've collected uh, over two million in land cover fees to date. We expect to collect another 1.7, primarily from the city of San Jose, with some projects, Communication Hill project. Uh, the Arcadia project and a couple smaller projects. Uh, we won't be reaching the six million threshold because there's been less development activity than originally anticipated, or at least less than will be 
uh, permitted by the end of this fiscal year. Um, part of the this six has been spliced off into the one for serpentine. The budget didn't project serpentine in, in June, but we anticipate uh, a million, collecting a, roughly a million dollars in serpentine fees, again, primarily from the city of San Jose. The Burling Owl, um, that was primarily, I, th I think uh, that there was gonna be more development going on in the Burling Owl Conservation Zone in the city of San Jose. We're, we're anticipating uh, that they'll probably, be, that we'll collect about two million overall. We've collected uh, almost 400,000 from Morgan Hill, which was given to the agency uh, due to mitigation that happened to prior to plan uh, implementation and uh, us getting the permit. Uh, we also will be collecting close to $600,000 from the water agency and that, that also is uh, pre-plan mitigation that's being uh, channeled to the agency. The, uh, the other million we project will be coming from projects from the city of San Jose. Nitrogen deposition, um, we projected it to be about 275,000 for the year. It might end up being more than that with a side conversation I just had with Jason. It, it might be double that, which is good news. Um, so we're, it, it might be closer to 500 than the, than, than the 275 I have here. Wetland impacts, there hasn't been a lot of wetland impacts to date and we don't expect uh, uh, much more in the way of wetland impacts. So we're anticipating it, it, only about 100,000. Uh, participating special entities are primarily from two projects, the Ferguson Road Project for Caltrans and uh, a small PG&E project. And we anticipate it to be about 175. Um, in June, they projected it to be 310. Uh, the grant funds uh, need to explain a little bit why there's that discrepancy. Uh, the two million is the, it was the anticipated section six grant for Coyote, uh, Coyote Ridge, uh, the UTC Coyote Ridge property. OSA applied for those funds, but without the plan, they would have never been able to get those funds, but we can't, put those in our budget because they're not funds that'll ever come to the agency. The land that'll eventually be enrolled will be part of the reserve system, so Coyote Ridge, but to, to put that in uh, as a revenue for the agency, we can't, but we can definitely credit the land. And, but we, we could have a little asterisk there. Without the plan, OSA would not have gotten the two million. We have uh, gotten an $85,000 it should be $85,135 grant from uh, the state. It's uh, one of the items on the agenda today, the local assistance grant, and that's to study uh, grazing within the, within the uh, county, South County area. So anticipated revenues will be um, 700, 7 million, 700, or $7,335,000. That's sort of what we anticipate them to be. And they were projected in June to be 14385000 um, Expenditures to date are 677173 There will be no anticipated capital expenditures, which were projected to be 11220153 uh, I'm, I'm assuming that when the budget was put together at that time frame, um, they were thinking of capital expenditures as acquiring land. Um, land is a capital asset and it will be dealt with once we get our financial accounting system in place as a separate ledger budget line and it, it'll show up in revenues and it'll show up in it as a capital asset. It wouldn't be a capital expenditure. The kind of capital expenditures we anticipate having would, you know, if we bought a truck or if we uh, buy other equipment, if we construct a restoration project, let's say we do a stream restoration project or a wetland restoration, we could classify those as capital expenditures. Or if we build a bridge 
uh, on, you know, reserve system land. Those, those are the kind of things that we would ex anticipate being capital expenditures. And we don't anticipate any, any of those expenditures um, in this fiscal year. Um, anticipated uh, expenses were approximately 1.7 million, um, will be 1.7 million, which is $520,000 less than the budgeted amount of 2,221,440. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we welcome Councilmember Herrera here. We now have a quorum for both boards. And I just want to jump back. I erred, and I did not ask to invite anyone. Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Herrera, um, thank you. Congratulations on that. You say congratulations, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, you do. All right. Um, I need to jump back to before starting and invite anyone from the public who wishes to speak about anything not on today's agenda. Not seen anyone. And Doug, you were on 12? Yes. Sir. Okay. Um, now we can go. Did you have a question? No. Now we can go back to um, item number one, which is approval of the minutes. Yes. I had a question. Please. Member Lazat. I'm, I'm curious about how the, the, the two million in grant funds wound up on the budget if it was, was it just a, a, a sort of a, taking credit for the land and not really the the money how was how, how that that's a, that's a big uh is yes just an interpretation or what is yes it? it was an interpretation that happened before my tenure here so I, I i can't shed any light on it other than my i i would assume your your sort of explanation would be the explanation that i would get that somehow uh they wanted to note that the land it was going to be acquired, um, but given that the OSA applied for the for the for the grant, it's um, it's kind of a tricky thing to put it in our our revenue stream. Right. Yeah. Right. But it shows up though as land. Yes, it will once once the land is enrolled. Okay. So most of that eighteen hundred eighty one acres of of that UTC Coyote Ridge property will be enrolled in the reserve system. And it scored so high on the Section 6 grant because it's, uh, it, it represents a significant uh, critical uh, habitat unit for the butterfly. So without acquiring that, that property or enrolling it in the land uh, uh, or the reserve system, uh, the plan would, um, at least for the butterfly, would, would be difficult to um, sort of achieve its objective goals and objectives. So from a land standpoint, it's probably one of the most important properties we, we, we need to acquire. But from a financial accounting standpoint, yeah, we can't put that, that amount of money in the budget. But the land will get credited. It'll be part of the reserve system. And we're already talking to OSA about how, how we're gonna enroll that property. Yeah. Wonderful. So another question. So going forward, I'm also curious about the the city of San Jose and the the fees that we were, we were expecting from development. Um, I can't see Jim. Uh, is um, are, are we? Was it really unanticipated going forward? Is is there a way for us to be a little more conservative in what we think? Because there's I was a San Jose City Council member. You can tell when projects aren't are or aren't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I I mean I think that the closer coordination maybe uh, going forward is something that I would be asking you to to do to make sure that if we put it in the budget, it's really something that's going to come down the pipe. I mean things happen. I know that. Absolutely, and I have a good working relationship with Jason and John Davison, so I'll I'll make sure that happens. Okay, All right. thank you, Jason. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, and I'd, I'd like to, um, excuse me just one second, Jason, I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Walt Glein here from our advisory commission. Thank you. Thank you. Jason. Thank you, Chair. I have a question for, there thank you, you Chair. I have a question just for, uh, just for Edmund. Uh, looking at, obviously, as you kind of started to fine tune some of these numbers about your uh, total budget revenues projected and what you're expected to come in, do you foresee there being any long-term impact with this adjustment? Because obviously, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a heavy adjustment from 14 down to seven. 
and even though you've been extremely conservative of how you've been able to uh, expend some of those some of those funds that you have, but as we all know, development you know dictate is dictated by the market. So if things don't come as you have already adjusted, uh, are you or do you have something in in prepare to be able to keep yourselves up and running? Yes, one one of the things we're going to be doing over the next year is developing financial policies for the agency, and part of that will be develop, uh, to creation of a sort of a rainy day fund. Uh, so certain monies will be set aside to keep the operations going. Right, right now, the only thing it would really affect would be our ability, if, if, a, if a landowner came in today and said, I want to sell my land to you, um, 14 million is a lot more than, than seven and a half. So it, it definitely affects our ability to buy land. But it also is an opportunity because, um, as I'll mention in my executive officer report, we, we need to build partnerships with uh, OSA, Parks, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Post, and others to work together to acquire these lands. It, and that's something that was always envisioned by, by this agency anyways, to work in partnership. So we, we might have to rely more on these organizations. And with OSA's measure being passed, um, that gives them the financial capacity to, to potentially help us out. We, we may have to borrow some money from the Nature Conservancy or Post, and they've offered in the past, at least uh, just sort of informally, that they would loan us money to buy land and we could pay them back with fees over time. So uh, the day-to-day -day operations are okay because it's, it's, I'm the only staff person. <laughs> and we have Jill, of course, too. Um, so we... No, no, I wish I did. <laughs> um, the organizations that you're mentioning all have land acquisition in their mission statement. Correct. And that's why they're all looking to partner and make our mission successful. Um, if we don't have the money to acquire the land, that, that's an interesting problem. But at the end of the day, the acquisition of land, all the groups that you're mentioning, it's what they want to do as well. So it's in their interest to see us succeed. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. I didn't mean to cut you off. You got your question answered and you're squared away. All right, so now we'll go back to item number one. Don't see any other questions. To approve the minutes of the prior meeting, which was September 18th. Do I have a motion to do so, Jason? So moved. Motion by Supervisor Smidian. Second. And second. Thank you, Member Lazat. I will be abstaining given I was not here at the meeting and do not feel comfortable being able to vote on the items that were discussed. All right. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, none. That passes unanimously. Are you okay picking up who we've got here? And you are, okay, with Jason abstaining. Uh, that was one. We now jump on to number three, the uh, Burrowing Owl Survey Summary and FEMAP Briefing. And, um, yes. Do you want to move up item 16 to number three? Yes, I think that would be an excellent idea. Thank you very much, uh, Edmund. Item 16, members, was to review the change in the Burrowing Owl impact fees and what Edmund's talking about there, and I, I appreciate your being agreeable to do that, is the discussion of um, that I thought should take place before action takes place. Go figure. I, yes. Let's discuss I, it before we vote on approving it. I so we're moving number 16 up to go along with number three as far as I'm concerned. I, I think it was a good suggestion. And, and Valerie, as far as any motion, it's number 16 is simply review a change. There is no action. Okay, and so I don't need, we don't need to hear 16 later or separate votes. Thank you. Okay, so we're hearing 16 and three together. Please go ahead, Edmund. So I'll, I'll do 16 first and then try, try and give you um, the presentation on um, both the map changes and give you a little background on uh, uh, an item that's on the implementation board agenda. I think it's item number 17. Um, so let me get my glasses on. You won't see me with these too much. So uh, the Habitat Agency imposes a burrowing owl conservation fee on covered activities that occur in occupied burrowing owl habitat. Occupied burrowing owl habitat is based on documented, documented nest occurrences, 
locations which change year to year. To determine where burrowing owls are nesting each year, the agency coordinates a county-wide burrowing owl survey during the nesting season. The 2014 survey results were combined with the 2012 and 2013 nest surveys to inform what is occupied burrowing owl habitat. So how the map changed. There are 4,023 acres of land subject to the fee. One new burrowing owl location was added to the fee map. The 4,023 acres subject to the fee is a decrease from the 6,076 portrayed in the original map. So you may ask why the decrease. Burrowing owls have not been documented at several of the sites where they were previously found in the last three survey seasons. Therefore, those areas have been dropped from the map. So though we added one a new location, the amount of acreage decreased by over, over 2,000 acres. So there less properties are now impacted by the fee overall. Any questions? None, we're having, you, said, you mentioned 17 as well? Oh yeah, um, Troy's presentation is going to address, uh, give, uh, give you a little background on item Item 17. I think it's item 17. Is that the SFBBO? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and board members, the reason I brought this up is item number nine um, on our agenda is the adoption of a resolution, change, you know, adopting the law, changing the law. And items 3, 16, and 17 were discussing that topic. So what was my intent was to have 3, 16, and 17 all being aired out now. If anyone from the public wishes to speak, on any of these three items, please let me know. Have those all aired out before we get down to number nine. And Valerie, 16 and 17 were receiving presentations as was three. So I don't think it matters if it's implementation board members voting or governing because there's nothing to vote on. Correct, that's not a problem. Thank you. And 17 is an action item of the implementation board. So. I mean, one of my favorite attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, 17 is an action item. It's approving an agreement with uh, SFBBO. Oh, okay. Then we will yep. we'll culminate with 17. Yes. Yes. Okay. But but for now we're doing three and 16. Okay. Any other questions on um, three and 16? We have a speaker card. It's Shawnee. Of course it's Shawnee. How are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Did you wish to speak on? Uh, Three or sixteen right now, or were you waiting for seventeen or nine? So I, I think it might be helpful if we did the presentation by the consultant first. Let's do it. Okay, thanks everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Troy Ramick. I'm um, with ICF International. And I know some of you have been working on the habitat plan for a number of years. Um, and one of the things that I've been working on during that entire time is burrowing owls and uh, burrowing owl issues as they relate to the, to the plan. So today, um, Edmund mentioned that uh, we have completed our, our first annual survey for, or not completed, but coordinated our first annual survey for burrowing owls in the county. And so what I wanted to do today, <clears throat> excuse me, was just, um, give you a quick overview of the burrowing owl conservation strategy. Um, if you know anything about it, you know that it's probably one of the most com complex parts of the plan. And so I'm just gonna give you a slide or two kind of hit the high points overview uh, for those of you who, who are, are not familiar or want a refresher. Give you an update on the, the coordinated uh, survey effort that we did this year. Um, and all of that will then culminate in me showing you what the new uh, fee map is for burrowing owls and that's what you'll be looking at uh, later in the meeting. And then after that, I'm gonna give you just a quick um, overview of the uh, management and monitoring that's, that's currently going on and it's going to continue at Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. That's the, the work that the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory and the refuge are going to do as part of a management agreement with the Habitat Agency if you approve that action today. So I'll just give you an overview of that as well. So um, 
to begin, and, and maybe just as a quick overview, um, thinking about you know, burrowing owls in the county and the way that we sort of assess them in our, uh, in our planning effort as part of the habitat plan, uh, we, we initially divided up burrowing owl habitat into three different habitat types, and they're shown here in a couple of different colors. The one that is of most interest and that we're really focusing on here today is what we termed occupied burrowing owl habitat. And so that was a new term that we defined in the plan. And essentially what it means is uh, any known nesting occurrence plus a half mile buffer around that occurrence to accommodate foraging habitat. Um, and we track that on three year increments. So if we have a known nesting occurrence within the past three years in an area, we take that plus a half mile buffer and we call it occupied burrowing owl habitat. Um, that is the area that the burrowing owl fee is assessed on. So if a covered activity occurs within that occupied burrowing owl habitat, the, the burrowing owl conservation fee is assessed. There are other types of burrowing owl habitat. There's potential burrowing owl habitat, um, habitats that meet the, the habitat characteristics and types that owls use, but there just aren't any nesting owls there uh, that we know of. Um, and then there's <clears throat> overwintering habitat, which is a little bit more up in the foothills, um, areas where we haven't had owls nesting uh, historically. And it doesn't mean that they couldn't at some point in the future, but they definitely use those habitats during the winter months. And one of the challenges we had when we were working on the, uh, the, um, the burrowing owl conservation strategy was that actually most of the best established burrowing owl colonies in the county fell outside of our, um, our habitat plan study area. So they're up north of, in North San Jose, but then also up in, um, in Santa Clara and Mountain View and, and, and up uh, there to the east in Fremont. And so we were forced with this issue where we were trying to manage for a species that only um, only a small portion of the population actually occurred in the population. So we created this uh, expanded burrowing owl conservation area. And on my screen, it's purple. You may not be able to see it, but it basically extends um, all the way up around the southern edge of, of the bay there. So basically it goes Palo Alto all the way around to Fremont. Now, nothing is really happening in that area. No activities are covered. Those cities and jurisdictions aren't part of the habitat plan. But that's an area that we wanted to be able to focus conservation efforts in. Um, and so we, we included that formally as part of the plan so that we could do conservation up there. It's the only covered species where we can do uh, conservation actions outside of our, our permit area, our study area. So just some key uh, highlights of this strategy itself. Um, one of the things we wanted to do, and this sounds kind of silly, but we wanted to you know, protect, protect and manage owls where they are. Right, so we wanted to, we only have burrowing owls in a few places, and we wanted to focus on protecting and managing those places first, knowing that we would like to get owls moving around and spread the population out and, and have owls in new locations in the future, but we weren't gonna worry about protecting those areas quite yet until we could stabilize the existing population. <coughs> we wanted to increase survival rates at the colony so we could get enough owls that they could hopefully naturally move to new locations um, so they wouldn't be as vulnerable to, uh, um, to, uh, to issues that might occur um, uh, to those populations over time. Um, we are funding management activities uh, on sites that are occupied. So as part of the boosting um, population numbers, we wanted to go and look at those areas that have owls and say, what could we do management-wise that could make it even better for owls? And you'll hear about that later on in the presentation. Um, and we wanted to get kind of a new baseline of where burrowing owls are. So a lot of agencies, and I'll talk about several of them in a few minutes here, but a lot of agencies and organizations in the South Bay survey for burrowing owls for various reasons, um, and they have been for a number of years. So we have a pretty good handle on the burrowing owl population uh, in the county, but there's a lot of places that don't get surveyed because it's private land or just there's no reason to do it. Um, so we wanted to really, as part of this planning effort during implementation, set a new baseline for where burrowing owls are located. Um, and we knew that in order to pull any of this off, we would have to coordinate with other uh, local jurisdictions and South Bay governments, uh, those cities that I mentioned that are not part of the habitat plan, but that howl, have owls in their jurisdictions. Um, and then all of the other organizations, um, Santa Clara Bay Audubon Society, um, the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, um, you know, Moffett Airfield and on. Um, so as part of that effort, we have some formal things in the plan that we have to do. We say we'll conduct at least two meetings a year, one before the, the, the breeding season starts and one at the end to have some formal coordination with those groups um, and to assist us in coordinating this, this annual survey effort. 
Um, and then there are several pilot studies. Things There are a lot of things we don't know about burrowing owls in the area, um, which is a little surprising, but um, we, we want to initiate some research activities, research projects around that. And some of that's already getting started, uh, even sort of outside of the habitat plan, um, so that we can just learn more about what really is suppressing the population so we can, you know, kind of uh, create some management uh, plans that may be able to fix that. So this year was the first full year of uh, implementation in that, you know, burrowing owls start nesting around March, um, sometimes a little earlier, and they nest all the way through the spring and summer into um, August sometimes. So this was the first full year where we could really get ahead of it. Um, and as, as part of the coordination of the survey effort, we, we sort of coined the term the South Bay Burrowing Owl Survey Network. Um, as I mentioned, there are lots of groups that are already surveying for burrowing owls every year for various reasons, and this is a list of them there. Um, the Habitat Agency, uh, with the support of ICF, we coordinated that effort, had our initial meeting in March, and just basically said, you know, we know you're already sur surveying for burrowing owls on your properties for whatever reason. Um, will you share your data with us and collect data, you know, in a somewhat systematic way? Um, this year was kind of the first run at that, so we were, you know, we weren't trying to like lay down the law and make sure that everybody was doing things exactly the way we wanted them to do, but we were really just trying to make sure that people were talking and coordinating, um, and that data was getting shared. So this is what the we the, the kind of coverage map looked like. So these are these um, we designated all these survey blocks and divided them up amongst those organizations that I just showed you. Um, as I said, some of them were already surveying certain blocks already, and then um, the ICF team and the Audubon Society and others kind of picked up um, those that weren't being surveyed by anybody else. Uh, the blocks in yellow are those that fall inside of our, our um, study area, and those uh, in black are outside of our study area. And then the, the pinkish uh, color is just um, the kind of existing areas historically where we've know, known about owls. So, And as a result of that, um, these are the, the numbers. So we, um, we came up with uh, the first annual report, so the, the um, South Bay uh, Burrowing Owl Nesting Report. We'll be producing that report every year. So at the end of every breeding season, you know, this group will come together, bring the data together, and we'll, we'll put a report out. Uh, that that um, that then will culminate in possible changes to a map on an annual basis and maybe not. But these are the numbers. Um, interestingly, uh, you know, the numbers of adults are a little bit higher than they have been in the in the last few years. We haven't had a really thorough kind of countywide survey effort like this since about 2006 and maybe 2008. Also, we we did some additional survey work for the habitat plan. Um, but this is the first time that we really, in a coordinated way, had people out looking and, and had people out looking in places where we might not have been looking before. Uh, so we ended up with 107 adults, about you know, 51 nesting pair, give or take. Um, when we look at uh, how that ranks or, or, um, or lines up with the expectations of the habitat plan, so this is a figure from the habitat plan that basically, you know, we put this together back in like 2008, I think. And so... Um, Back then, we were thinking we started with about a population of around 70, uh, 70 adults that the Habitat Agency would be um, contributing towards or, or responsible for. Um, and then as it goes over the 50-year permit term, that number is going to, you know, it's not going to go up like that. It's, you know, this is clearly just an, you know, a cartoonish depiction of that. But um, the idea is that uh, eventually we're going to get up to, you know, somewhere around 220 pair. So right now, if you think about where, where are we now, um, that's about where we are. Now, that's not, that doesn't mean that we went from 70 owls to 107 owls. What, the, what really that means is that, you know, like a lot of other things in the habitat plan, we did, the, did all of that back in 2006, 7, and 8. Um, we were looking at numbers that, as they were back then, and now it's 2014, you know, six years later. Um, so there's going to be some natural growth in the population. So I don't want you to think that it just, like, exploded this year for any particular reason. It probably happened over time. So why the increase? Um, more comprehensive survey effort uh, is one thing. Um, we didn't really have any, anything earth shattering, like we didn't have owls popping up uh, in a lot of new places or anything like that. We basically found owls where we historically have had owls and we didn't find owls where we didn't have owls. So there's nothing really earth shattering come out like that. But um, uh, two things that, that are happening that I think added to the numbers. One is the restoration efforts happening at the Santa, uh, San Jose Santa Clara um, Water Pollution Control Plant, uh, work being done by the City of San Jose and the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. Um, you know, there have been owls at, at, at the, uh, on the buffer lands at the plant in the past, um, but in the last few years, there have been some directed efforts on part of that property to make it better for owls. 
um, and that's working. So the numbers have, have increased. And similarly, at Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge, they've begun doing a little bit of work out there, and the Habitat Agency hopefully will be assisting them in the future, and I'll talk to you more about that. But in a similar way, they've just had a little bit more directed efforts at um, some grassland restoration and burrowing owl um, habitat enhancement efforts. So the distribution of occupied burrowing owl habitat. So after we did the surveys, we then you know, went back to the original question, where are the owls? And then and if we add a half mile buffer around those nest occurrences, um, that becomes our new occupied burrowing owl habitat. Um, and that's what it looks like for, for the entire sort of you know, North San Jose, well, really Santa Clara County, because we didn't find any owls south. Um, so you can see that a lot of it, most of it, is still in other jurisdictions outside of the, uh, out of the habitat plan study area. Um, there certainly are still, you can see, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse here. This, you know, this big blob here is the San Jose Airport and adjacent lands, so there's still a big population at the airport. Um, and then as you sort of bubble that half mile out, that picks up some other lands, and there are, are some owls in other, other places um, just off airport. Um, and then the, oops, in this area up here, this is the, um, the water pollution control plant that I mentioned. Um, we have some owls over here by, the, by Levi Stadium and in, on adjacent lands. And then as we go south, we have, this is um, the, uh, just adjacent to the, um, is it Arcadia or Arca Arcadia? I can never remember that property. Me Meadow Fair Park is, so, yeah, Arcadia, yeah, sorry. Um, Meadow Fair Park, and there have been owls there for <laughs> years. Um, or uh, owl, an owl or a pair of owls, not a lot of owls. Um, and then the, the new location that Ed mentioned was down here on um, near Communication Hill on Dairy <laughs> Hill. Um, these are owls that were, uh, there were nesting owls there last year in 2012, or I'm sorry, 2013. Um, we surveyed that area this year and there weren't owls there this year, but as part of that three year, <coughs> rolling three year window, they get picked up in, in the habitat, um, ha habitat uh, layer. So that's what it looks like for the entire kind of distribution of the owls. And then if we just cut that, you know, to our study area, these are the, this is the new, effectively the new uh, burrowing owl fee map. So this is the areas that are subject, when, where covered activities would be subject to the burrowing owl conservation fee. Um, not a lot of new there. Ed mentioned that the acreage actually went down a couple thousand acres, which sounds like a lot. Um, one thing I'll point out about that is that the, the original occupied burrowing owl habitat, um, it wasn't based on a three-year window by by any means, it was based on um, all occurrences uh, all occurrences of burrowing owls that we had at the time, and that was up through about 2008. So we were including occurrences in that layer um, that weren't just from 2006, seven, and eight. They actually were owls, any owls that had been seen, um, you know, nesting in the area. So we looked at the California Natural Diversity Database and collected other information from other local experts, and we applied the half mile buffer to those. And so you ended up with, um, you know. The, the culmination of that was just, you know, a, a much, a much bigger area than we actually probably had owls in, um, and so now the, the the whittling down of that is probably just the new baseline. It's probably not anything, you know, nothing really actually happening out there um, on the land with the habitat. It's just like this is the the reality of where we are today, rather than where we were probably six years ago. It's one thing that we often forget that a lot of the data that we look at in the habitat plan was developed in you know 2006 through 2008. Um, and I was part of that effort, and so now it's 2014, and so we have to reset our expectations sometimes. So um, that's, you know, that's kind of where we are th uh, this year. That was the, uh, the, the 2014 survey, as I mentioned, as it's a requirement in the Habitat Plan that we do this every year. So we're already getting ready to, to plan the meeting for March to get the group back together and, and get going on 2015 surveys. Um, we'll do a similar summary of results at the end of the year next year and then be back in front of you again probably this time again next year with um, potentially a change in the map or not depending on what we find. So before the next thing I was going to do was move on to the, um, the work that's going on at Don Edwards but maybe I could just if it's okay just pause for questions on that. Yes. Um, the Arcadia site is that is that where there are burrowing owls there that's burrowing owl habitat or what? How is that defined? There's bur there are burrowing owls at Meadow Fair Park, which is just adjacent to that site, um, and and on the site itself. And the entire the, the site is considered burrowing owl habitat, and it has been you know for for a number of years. So the when you um, when you buffer the occurrences with the half mile and create the occupied habitat. In other words, the the owls may be at the park, but they're certainly using the Arcadia site for foraging. Um, so if that site you know gets developed eventually one day, um, I would 
I would not be surprised if those owls, you know, ceased to be there anymore, just because there probably won't be any place for them to forage. How many, how many pair, or how many exactly have we seen on that site? Uh, just one, just one pair this year, and over the last number of years, actually, Shawnee may have a, a better answer than this. There's always been about one pair, um, never more than a couple, that, to my knowledge, historically. So it's just, a, a, you know, a kind of a remnant uh, nesting pair there. So that, that site happens to be in my council district, mm -hmm. and um, th there is development moving forward on that. Right. And I guess I, I just wanted to ask the director, is, is that one of the projects that we're looking at fees or we're looking, is that included in our projections? Yes. Is that some of the things that didn't, that we thought we were going to come in sooner that didn't come in or? Um, I think what was originally assumed is that more of that site was going to be developed. In my conversations with the city, they yeah. only think about 10 or 15 acres of that site will be developed. It, at least by, uh, at least they'll start grading and construction before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so, yeah, because the site is going to be fully developed, but it's going to happen over a long period of time. So I think that's, and that's maybe some of what we're seeing, maybe some of these other projects, there's phasing going on. I think so. Okay, that's Communication helpful. Hill, I met with KB Homes, and there's that's phasing, so phasing can... going with that too. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know there was another question about the owls. I'll think of it in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue. Okay. So um, one of the things, one of the sort of cornerstones of the Burrowing Owl Conservation Strategy is, you know, we, we would love, like all of the other covered species, we would love to be able to say, we, let's go out and buy lots of habitat for burrowing owls. But the reality is there isn't a lot of habitat available, for, at least where there are currently burrowing owls nesting. And one of the challenges we have, there are two challenges. One is that most of that area currently, as you saw by the map, is in kind of North San Jose and on up the peninsula um, in places where it's per acre some of the most expensive real estate in the country. So if you think about how far would your conservation dollar go, not very far. The other thing is that a lot of the places where burrowing owls are currently um, nesting, it's on you know, some type of public land, federal land, airports, and, and so on. And so it's not like we're going to be able to go in and, and buy land or get a conservation easement on you know, San Jose International Airport, for example. So what we did in the burrowing owl uh, conservation strategy was came up with a, kind of a unique thing where we, we allow the agency to enter into management agreements with public agencies or other landowners or whatever, um, where the land isn't put into uh, you know, long-term in perpetuity protection, but we enter into kind of a contract with them for you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, there's no set time frame. It could be flexible. And effectively what that means is that they, they agree to manage their property as burrowing all habitat for a set amount of time, five years or whatever. Um, and the reason, for, the reason behind that was we wanted to find ways that we could initially engage in burrowing owl conservation in the first you know, 10 years, say, of the, of the habitat plan implementation and find a way to boost burrowing owl numbers to a point where the population was healthy enough that it could start naturally you know, distributing into other habitats. Um, so, that's, so anyway, that's a kind of a long-winded way of saying that one of the primary charges of the agency at this point in time with burrowing owls is to look for opportunities for these management agreements. And we're actively having conversations with lots of different, um, lots of different jurisdictions about that. The first one to come up was, is an opportunity that we have at Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge um, where they, their uh, Warm Springs unit, um, just skip through this here for a second. So actually, let me back up, sorry. I remembered my question. There, uh, there are worms, do you wanna, do you wanna do you ask it now or I can wait till the oh, end? I, I, it's it relates to what you're just gonna talk about. So, and maybe I missed it. Um, what gives us authorization to go beyond the habitat plan to work with conserving brewing owls that are outside of, I mean, what, what's the foundational uh, law or whatever that allows us to go beyond that and help with conservation that's outside of our area? Yeah, you it's a really, it, really good question. Just... Yeah, really good question. So um, the one important thing that I'll start with is to say that in that, that expanded, and I'll show you here with my mouse hopefully, that expanded burrowing owl area, that purple area on the map, which goes into these other jurisdictions, the only thing that we can do there is burrowing owl conservation. So it's a very a finite thing that can happen there. No other covered activities or anything will happen out there. No other conservation for other species. Um, the only thing that allows us to do that is simply that in the, in the habitat plan, in the conservation conservation strategy, we recognize the fact that 
it's really a uh, it's really put forward as a regional recovery strategy for burrowing owls, uh, kind of a South Bay recovery strategy for the species. And in order for us to be successful in the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Plan uh, uh, study area, we're going to have to make sure that these other burrowing owl populations are re remain healthy. So, um, excuse me, Troy, if yes. I may, just I because I think I understand the question a little differently. The developers outside of the plan area that have burrowing owls could go to the federal and state governments directly and not go through our habitat okay. plan. We're an option for them. Okay. So do we have legal jurisdiction? Do they have to go through us? No. no. People inside our plan area? Yes. Okay. Outside, but we're an alternative for them. Okay. Yep. That's absolutely correct. Yep. And it's merely a, it's not a, the, the burrowing owl, it's an important point, is not a state or federal listed species. So it's merely a CEQA issue in those cases. So they deal with growing out through their CEQA documentation. Um, so yeah, the, the, it would be an option to use the Habitat Agency as a mitigation and, avenue. And, and one thing I'd like to add, we, we commented on the city place development in the city of Santa Clara. We wrote a letter, um, some of the environmental groups did, the state did, saying that you're impacting burrowing owls and you can mitigate your impacts through the plan. We also commented on nitrogen so that gives us an opportunity then to increase uh, revenue to purchase more land too. Is that an opportunity? Ab absolutely. That and again, an I mean, our, our mission was a win-win for environmentalists and developers working together. So that's an option for them. Or they can say no to us and they can Until take their chances with, with the federal and state government. And is this the only, why is this the only species then? So we, had, we mentioned other species in the plan, didn't we, besides burrowing owls? Oh yeah, yeah. What the only species where we are going to be doing this kind of process with? It's the only species where we expanded our study area for for this reason. That's right. So so all of the other covered species in the plan, the conservation will be happening inside of the red inside of the study area here. And is that because we have those species occur That's naturally right. in there? This is the one where That's they correct. don't. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if we would have said if we wouldn't have expanded it, we would have been left with basically, you know, San Jose Airport and surrounding lands the the water pollution control plant and and you know meadow fair park <laughs> so we, we knew we had this to kind of reach out and find something new Great. so um the, what's happening up at at the uh warm at um don edwards national wildlife refuge so that's if you look at this map here and the stars that's is this star up here so it's up in fremont um and you a lot of you are probably familiar with the the sort of san jose side of the refuge which is more uh you know tidal marsh and, and salt flat um, this part of the refuge, their Warm Springs unit, um, which is shown here, is uh, uh, kind of a matrix of seasonal wetland and grassland. And they've had owls out there for, you know, historically, uh, over the years, the population has cycled high and low. Um, these are some numbers that they have from the last couple of years. You can see the wetlands on the site, so they have vernal pool species out there as well and other things. But they're really interested in doing some grassland restoration on the site and finding ways to boost their burrowing owl numbers. So um, they've come to the Habitat Agency with, kind of, with a proposal that basically outlines how they will do that for the next five years. Um, and a couple of things, a couple just kind of points on that. I mean, they've already started this work. They, they did the work uh, this year for the first time. And, had some pretty good initial results. They started small and their, their plan with uh, some funding from the Habitat Agency would be to expand that effort. Um, they involve a lot of volunteers in the work that they do. Um, and essentially breaks down into, um, you know, just a few buckets of what, what will actually be happening out there. So they'll be doing, they're already doing survey work for burrowing owls. They're gonna continue that effort on an annual basis. They provide that data to the Habitat Agency as part of the coordinated effort that I mentioned. Um, doing lots of vegetation management, keeping the grass short for owls, that's what they like. Um, enhancing the prey base, so there are lots of things that can be done to um, increase the, uh, the number of insects and, and other, you know, really small mammals and things like that that burrowing owls eat. Um, they're installing some rock piles and some vegetative islands, so areas where grass is a little taller, um, which can harbor insects and things that owls eat. And then also doing some predator control. So they have, like most places in, in the urban Bay Area, they have um, some feral cat problems, they have lots of skunk problems and some possums and stuff. And so part of it, what they'll, what they'll be doing would be, they already do a lot of predator control on the refuge and they'll just be expanding that effort um, on the Warm Springs site. All of those things, um, you know, I think we'll, we've, we've sort of proven that all of those things will boost the numbers of burrowing owls uh, on the property. Uh, and that that's, comes to the, the conclusion of what's happening at Warm Springs. Um, any questions on anything that I've talked about so far? 
No, thank you. That concludes Troy's portion. Edmund, that was just so we're keeping our numbers right. We have four items on our agenda that deal with bur burrowing owls. Nine and 17 are action items, but what we're dealing with right now are three and 16. He just finished three. Do you have anything to add to 16? No, no, Chairman. Jones, did you have any pre presentation, anything you wanted to mention about 16? No, no, that uh, what, what I presented before his presentation was sort of covering that. Yes. Good, okay. thank you. Um, Shawnee, why don't you come forward? Have up to three minutes to uh, speak. And well, no. Do you want do you want to speak to each? All right, two minutes each. You got you got four minutes. There you go. Well, you don't need that, but okay. So I'm Shani Kleinhaus. I'm the environmental um, advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. We have been monitoring boring owls in the valley for many many years, and have witnessed their decline. I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing right now. Uh, one thing we have is a grant, uh, one of the LAG grants. Uh, we are sponsoring uh, scientists to go and monitor and band and follow um, wintering boring owls. So that's moving forward. Another project that we're doing, and that is from HCP funds uh, from the state, but uh, it, the habitat plan was not ready to accept them when the, uh, so we applied and, um, and the project is moving forward. Uh, we're doing surveys for many years. Until now, we've financed our own sections of the survey. We'll probably come to you guys in the future to ask to continue those surveys. And we surveyed a lot of the areas that were not normally surveyed. So in Santa Clara County and at the Warm Springs unit of um, the uh, national um, W Wildlife Service. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with the city of San Jose. Thank you, Vice Mayor Herrera. Uh, and we are monitoring the populations of the regional wastewater uh, pollution plant, and we are also improving the habitat there. This project is amazing. A lot of people participate. A lot of people get to see the owls, and the owls are doing well. And it's the only place in the, in the state where boring owl population is actually increasing. Everywhere else, they continue to plunge, and that's true for the rest of our county as well. Um, so we continue to be very engaged, and we continue to be very, very worried for the future of the owls. So one of the things that I wanted to say after listening to what happens to the fees of Arcadia, Arcadia has had owls there for a very long time. There are a few more around in the hills, everywhere at the airport other places, uh, Quimby area, most of those have gone, are gone either because of development or whatever reason, sometimes we don't know. Um, there was a pair that raised chicks last year at the, at, the, at the park, and they were there this year. One of them got hurt, uh, got released after it was treated, but there were no chicks this year. Um, and next year after construction, begins, even if construction only happens on 10 acres, it's likely that they'll abandon, which means that the entire area eventually will not be paying into the HCP because the owls, the 10 acres will probably be substantial enough to extirpate them from that site, they'll be gone, and when we come to development a few years from now of the rest of that land, there won't be any fees because there will be three years of no owls or whatever. So I think that's something that you need to look at and not just say, oh, you know, we'll pay 10 acres for 10 acres now, we'll develop all this, the entire site 10 years from now or whatever, it takes a long time. Meanwhile, we lose those owls forever. So that's an issue I wanted to bring up. Another one is that I, uh, our surveys actually don't look, at least from the information we have, it looks like in Santa Clara County, they're not increasing. And I know we've seen that there's uh, 51, but that includes sections of outside of this county. Uh, what we think is sometimes, sometimes happens is you count an owl in Mountain View, and then you go and count the same owl over at Moffett because something happened, the owls move, they move a lot until they have chicks, then they don't move anymore for a really little while. But they do move a lot, so we do count them more than once occasionally, and we think that the population right now is around 30 pairs in Santa Clara County and I'm not saying anything about the other areas. Thank you.
Thank you, Shawnee. And uh, we're dealing with three and 16 right now. Both recommended actions are simply to receive. Is there any other comments or questions regarding either of those items? Yes, I, I just Vice want, Mayor. I just want to publicly say thank you to Shawnee Kleinhouse and Audubon for the fantastic work that's been done by the city of San Jose. And I, I had one question for, for Shawnee, and I don't know if you can answer this or if it's possible, because I'm, I'm new to Burring Owls. It, is, it, is it possible or is it a good idea or is it even possible to have um, the ability to, to observe the burrowing owls at, at the water treatment plant for maybe uh, students? Or are we able to do that or would that totally disturb them? Is we can, way, and any, we have, have been, we, we, a, lot, well, a lot of students from San Jose State have been involved in this project. They come in, they do volunteer work, or sometimes they just come to see. Uh, we had one family day for uh, employees of the environmental, um, group, uh, CARES group, environmental services, and people came and had a great time. The owls are skittish, and we don't want to bring a lot of people all the time. Yeah. But, we, but, if, but when people want to see or students want to see and get involved, we, uh, we do create opportunities and allow them to come. We also have a student in San Jose State who is doing, um, he's a, he's a, now he's going to be a paid intern soon and he's doing a project there. And um, we hope to attract additional students to do like um, graduate thesis and, and things like that. There are a lot of really fascinating things happening there. Even the piles, just a little story, sorry. The piles of dirt that are brought up for the owls, when you look at them, each one was brought from a different place and they bring things with them. So some of them have like mushrooms coming out of them and some of them gophers are coming out of them and some of them have invasive species and some of them have native puppies. So there's a lot of things can be done there uh, scientifically and engaged and we're looking at ways to do that. And, well, it, it's a great partnership, and I know ESD has been, our environmental, environmental Services Department has been very excited about the work that's been done. So I just want And to they're doing work. a fantastic job. And any one of you who wants to see them, let us know. We'll be happy to take you out there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And your staff. All right. So that concludes 3 and 16. Move on to item number 4, which is a report from Edmund, our executive officer. <clears throat> Thank you. Just wanted to give you an update on the RGP process. The, the saga continues. So, <laughs> um, We were supposed to meet with Colonel Morrow, uh, who is the supervisor of the San Francisco district of the division that represents California and some other states. Um, unfortunately, he had a travel on Tuesday, so we didn't get a chance to meet with him. We're going to schedule a meeting with him in February to tell him where. Travel here, he had to travel somewhere else? Somewhere else. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so we're hoping we can meet with him in February and express some of our concerns about the delays in processing our permit because uh, every, everything has been done. It was an administrative review back in May. Um, so we're frustrated. I've shared that frustration with the, the boards uh, in past meetings. If we don't get a satisfactory result from the Colonel, a commitment uh, to a completion date uh, of sometime early this year, um, then that, yeah. I'll drop member Lazat's name. I, if, if you don't, yeah. Yes. And then we're going to go to the, <laughs> the general and speak to the general and say um, this is this is not acceptable yeah and we'll start getting electeds involved so and and I know they 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 will respond to uh, pressure from local state and federal electeds and and that and that'll be our next our, our next step and I'll, I'll coordinate that with the with the boards and seek advice on um, and how to proceed thank you please have a very short leash. I, I believe, it, as I recall, every two years a different colonel is, is assigned Correct. to the Western Regional United States. So just when you get on somebody's calendar or get somebody to know that you're a pain in the rear or that, you're, that you have an issue, they leave. Yes. Somebody else comes in and it's retraining 101. And, and this uh, Colonel Miles relatively new. Um, he has an impressive resume. He's well educated, even a public policy degree. So I'm hoping we can. Um, uh, sort of 
reach him and, 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 and reach out to him and, and, and speed this up. Thank you. Uh, PSE update, I mentioned Ferguson Road and PG&E um, during the budget uh, briefing. Uh, land enrollment, um, the Caltrans donation, their right away group, it, there's a 55 acre parcel on, uh, off of 152 and Pacheco Creek that uh, Caltrans is gonna donate to us and they're gonna donate it with an endowment and, and uh, also upfront management costs and possibly even funds to do restoration out there. And their right away group approved it. So uh, hopefully that'll happen this year. It, it, it may be the first parcel of the, of the new agency. So small, but still significant. Uh, public land enrollment is continuing. Uh, the, the, the ones that are uh, priority now are uh, the County Park, uh, Claro, and the OSA Park uh, in Coyote Valley. We're collaborating with PG&E on a, acquiring a, a property in the Tulare Hill area. Hopefully uh, uh, the landowner, uh, we can weed some agreement with that landowner. Uh, we, I've met with our conservation partners, as I mentioned earlier, to try to discuss land acquisition collaboration. I have talked to several private landowners um, and hopefully, um, be able to get get one of the one one of the problems with some of the private landowners is we can only pay fair market value for the property so sometimes their sort of expectations on what they think the property is worth is is beyond our ability to negotiate with them since fair market value give or take a few thousand is about is about the best we can do um, I've made that clear to some of the landowners uh, that, that's, that that's what we can do. Um, so I'm going to reach out to Pratt and Whitney again and some of the other landowners and um, hopefully that'll lead to next steps which is hiring a realtor to kind of help us shake the trees more and try to find out if there's more landowners out there that want to sell us land that we would want to buy. And then we're going to start being more proactive with the section six process so we're going to try to line up uh, funding partners now and and get a willing landowner lined up now because the application is due in november but if you don't have everything lined up now you're kind of dead in the water on that one so that's that's um conclusion of my executive officer report thank you i'm smiling because a half hour ago he was commenting the problem we'd be in if we had all this land offered and we didn't have the money and now we're talking about having the money and not being able to buy the land. So it depends on, on uh, exactly. what kind of day it is. <laughs> Thank you for that report. Any questions of the executive director? And yeah, no one from the public wishing to speak. Yes. What's, what's the minimum, is there a minimum acre size for us to purchase land? It, it kind of depends on location. It's that mantra of real estate, location, location, location. Okay. She has a yes. three bedroom, two bath house. <laughs> She's... If you mind donating it to me, my, my family and I will be looking for a house soon. So. <laughs> Um, but if it's if it's land that's been um, classified as uh, moderate to high priority uh, per per the reserve system design, then uh, five acres or 500 acres. If it's kind of viewed as sort of that in sort of that conservation biology sense of a large uh, contiguous landscape, or it has value for connectivity, yes, to answer your question. Uh, on the small, the smallest parcel we think. Yeah. I just so to... I think so. But it, but but if it's in the right place, if it's in the right place, absolutely, we'd be interested in buying it. You know, Creek Corridor, or it's it's a piece of a, a larger puzzle. Yeah. There's some development in my district where people were bringing up the idea of wondering if if Habitat Plan would be interested in it, and um, I could talk to you about it off offline. Um, see if that makes any sense. Super, thank you. We now move on to items five and six, which, which are governing board action only. So Angie, you've got a pretty good idea who's on governing, who's on governing and implementation, implementation only. So we're now on items five and six, which are on the consent agenda. Anyone from the governing board that wishes to make a motion to accept? I'll move approval of the consent calendar. Approval is even better. And a second, any discussion? 
being no one from the public wishing to speak on five and six. All in favor of governing board members of approving items five and six say aye. 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 Opposed? None. That passes unanimously. Nice job, Angie. All righty. We now move on to item number seven, which is a governing board action. Um, this one, let me give a little, well, I'll, just, I'll just say it. Um, Kat right now is the current chair of the governing board. I am the vice chair of the governing board. Uh, we spoke to Kat um, by phone since she was ill and not able to attend here and asked her was she interested in staying. And she said she would be happy to stay if nobody else wished to become the chair. Um, I've been on enough boards, and all of you have as well, where normally the vice chair becomes the chair, normally, um, should the chair step down. In this case, the existing chair is willing to stay, unless anyone else wishes to be the chair. And even though, Valerie, I'll do this through you, we're going a little bit out of order. On item 14 is the selection of the implementation board chair and vice chair. I'm the chair of the implementation board. It meets more often than the governing board. Um, it's more, I'll just, I'll just throw this out there. I'm desirous of staying chair of the implementation board. It meets more often and I can make that commitment to do that. The entire habitat conservation plan, the entire thing, is in my supervisorial district hitting a number of different cities. Um, that's one of the reasons that, that I'm here. So I'm kind of tying in item 14, which is the selection of the implementation board chair and vice chair. And one more point to mention, the current vice chair of the implementation board, Brian Schmidt, is no longer on the water district and no longer here. So we will need somebody for that. Um, Yes, and then to Vice Committee. Speaking of the plan being in the entire district, I yes. believe it's in the entire district of the water district, so yes. I would have an interest in being the vice chair. Okay, and the vice chair of which? On the implementation. On the implementation board. Okay, and I don't, Valerie, tell me if I get a skew here. Okay, so we're on item seven, governing board. I'm um, desperate to make a motion, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Please, Supervisor, <laughs> Supervisor Simidian. Given the value of uh, continuity, given the fact that we've been a little uh, slower ramping up than we thought, given the comments about the coming and going of colonels, uh, I'd like to uh, move that we retain the current vice chair and chair of the governing board. It's the only board I sit on, and therefore it's the only one I'm privileged to make a motion on. Second. Thank you. And actually, this is governing board action only, is what I'm getting there from the look from our attorney. Absolutely. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion on that? Anyone from the public? No? Okay, governing board members only. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously from governing board members. Thank you all very much. Thank you for continuing on. Thank you. And um, <laughs> it's funny how you get assigned to things when you're not here, but Kat was open to staying on this. And uh, she just wanted to, to point out if anyone wished. I've said that already, haven't I, Mayor Tate? Okay, we now move on to item number eight. Again, we are governing board actions only right now. And it is the, see, Edmund, this is probably you. Yes, it's the AB. AB 1600 development impact fee. So uh, the action is to review and accept the AB 1600 development impact fee report for fiscal year 1314. The AB 1600 or mitigation fee act requires any jurisdiction imposing development fees must report the following. A brief description of the type of fee in each account or fund, the amount of the fee, the beginning and any balance of the account or fund and the amount of the fees collected and the interest earned. Um, the AB 1600 revenues that we have to report on were 310,652. The non-AB 1600 revenues were 640,160. The AB report balance was a negative 394,575 after agency expenses of 705,409. Uh, the summary of uh, agency receipts and expenses is on page 110 if you want to quickly review that. 
and on page 109 is uh, shows you a summary of which fees were considered AB 1600 fees and which ones weren't. Um, and I can go I can go in more details on any of this if you would like. Seeing any questions and just so it's public, any member of the public wish to speak? Next speaker card I have is item number 12. Any member of the public wish to speak on 8, 9, 10, or 11? Seeing none, you've completed your comments. Any questions? Otherwise, Valerie, we do need a vote, a motion to accept. So move. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, governing board members, all in favor say aye. 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 That passes unanimously, Angie. Item nine. Item nine is the action that was discussed at the joint meeting. It's the adoption of a resolution revising uh, the Burling Isle Conservation Fee Zone map. And I have nothing uh, more to report on that. Thank you. Do we have a motion from a motion governing board adopt. member? Motion to adopt. The Thank proposal. you. Second. And we have a second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all governing board members in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. We go on to item number 10. Number 10 is the fee ordinance date change and the action requested is that the governing board introduce an ordinance amending ordinance number 2013-01 uh, to revise the annual effective date for the imposition of, up, of updated mitigation fees on development within the geographical boundaries of the Santa Clara Valley Habit Habitat Plan area. Edmund, excuse me, are you in, you're introducing ordinance 2015-01? It should be, yeah, 15, yeah, 01. yeah. Oh, it's uh, amending. Amending 1301 yes, by 13 introducing 1501. Right. Correct. Thank you. Sorry. Nope, no problem. Thank you. So it's introducing, yes, uh, to revise the the boundaries of the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Plan area from, uh, so the date changing it from June 1st of each year to July 1st of each year to be more aligned with the fiscal cycle of all the agencies and uh, co-permittees. Thank you for that report. Valerie, this says introduce. It seems to me it's just been introduced. Is there a motion to introduce? I'm well, there should be a motion technically to waive reading and introduce the ordinance. Okay, then I'm looking for a motion to waive reading of the ordinance, introducing the ordinance. So moved. Thank you. <laughs> Angie, a motion and a second. Tate Herrera. Uh, governing board, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Not well, this passes. will come back for adoption the next time the governing board meets. Understood. Thank you. 11. Uh, 11 is development fee adjustments in the action is uh, adopt a resolution approving the mitigation fees imposed upon new public and private development within the geographical boundaries of the plan area for fiscal year 1516 and for the non mitigation charges for participating special entities. So the plan calls for um, automatic inflation adjustment to the plans development fees. Uh, the ordinance adopting the development fees incorporates this annual adjustment. As noted in the attached urban ec economics report, the three fees that fund land acquisition increased by 5.7%. Those are land cover, serpentine, and nitrogen. And the wetland and burrowing owl fees increased by 3.6% from fiscal year 15 levels. Um, in fiscal year 14, the fees that fund land acquisitions increased by over 9% and the other fees increased by nearly 10. So I guess the good news is, is they didn't go up as much. They won't be going up as much this year as they did last fiscal year. Thank you, Edmund. And th this, I don't mean to cut you off. Did you finish? Uh, I, I can, yeah, I can, I can continue or whichever. Thank you. The yes. inflation increase that you referred to was put into the plan prior to your arriving here. And for those members that weren't here at the time when that was done, there was consensus among the board members, a unanimous consensus among the board members of tying in with inflation as compared to no raise, no raise, no raise. Hey, public, 27% increase. Um, I'm a big fan of the steady as she goes. Mm -hmm. PG&E, San Jose water incremental type 
Dealey Bob. And so there's wording. Now, given that, isn't there also in the plan, Edmund, and I, I know you've read the whole plan, so I'll put <laughs> you on the spot. Isn't there also in the plan every five years, seven years, that we look at it and see where we are, even though in case there needs to be another minor adjustment? Yep. Yes. Okay. So for the new, for members that weren't here previously, the idea, the plan for the plan was to have annual increases based on inflation. And then every five years to look back and say, okay, are we keeping up with reality? And recessions and bubbles come and go in there. So that's the reason for, for looking back. So we don't get too far ahead or get too far behind. Um, I, I think that that's good management, frankly. Thank you. Thank you for that input. So the fee increases also apply to the PSEs, as I mentioned. Indices used were the house pricing index and the consumer price index. Uh, the development fee schedule, the new development fee schedule is attached to the resolution. It's Exhibit A. Uh, although staff believes these fee adjustments are automatic and administrated by nature, we felt that given the newness of the agency, it would be advisable to have the governing board approve the fees by resolution. Thank you. So that concludes your presentation. We have no speakers on 11. Governing board members looking for a motion to approve. Move approval of the resolution. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Andrew? No. Nope. Member Herrera? Oh, Andrew, do you have a question? I'll go first. Okay. okay. Uh, what, what is the, uh, the sort of the outreach plan for the, the new fees once they're out? How do you distribute that information? I know it's not effective for a while, but. Yes, the co committees had told me that it was sort of done suddenly, the 11th hour last time, um, per uh, approval by the governing board. I will uh, release these next week to all the co committees so they'll be aware um, far in advance. The, the date is still June 1st, but it, but it will effectively change to July 1st per the governing board meeting in, in, in June. So, Good, but we're, giving, yeah. we're putting five months notice out there to be very yeah. transparent. That was your that's question exactly, as well? That's exactly my question. And yeah. do, do we need to have a hearing or anything, or do they need to be able to weigh in on it, or uh, do we just, I mean, we're, we have the authority to do this, so. Yes. It's just basically notifying them. And yes, them and, the and, and letting the co you know, all the, the county and the three cities, and, and as, as well as VTA and the water district, just, uh, just letting them know that this is the, the new fee schedule. And so next week I'll, I'll, I'll release it, and. And it'll be posted on the web page too. Right. Thank you. And I believe we had a motion and a second, but did not take a vote. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Governing board, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Passes unanimously. Now we run at 12. Doug, do you want to speak before or after the staff presentation? Fine. Come on forward. You have 21 minutes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, you anticipated my. Uh... <laughs> My ask, I was going to say if I had just a little more time, because this is exciting stuff, I could tell you how you can use molasses to get cows to move over and eat invasive weeds. But oh, thank you, you. Know, you got only three minutes. minutes. The clock has started. Go. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, board members and staff. For the record, my name is Doug Muirhead. I live in Morgan Hill. Uh, my questions tonight have to do with the organizations who are uh, going to have their lands monitored by this uh, program. Uh, Section 3A or packet page 143 identifies uh, the uh, county parks and University of California as having given you permission to monitor some of their lands. Uh, I spoke to the field operations manager at the Open Space Authority yesterday at their board workshop and asked him if he had been uh, invited to participate. He said no. So my first question is, did you talk to other organizations who chose not to participate? And the follow-on question would be, do you have any plans to uh, invite other organizations to participate? And if so, who might they be? And when might you extend those invitations? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Yes. We, yes. And, and Troy's here. He helped uh, prepare the grant. Uh, so Troy can weigh in also. Um, this is a study and the results that we, uh, so sort of the, the information we gather from this study we will share that information with everybody. Um, Troy, do you know if um, why these? Yeah, thank you.
Sure, yeah, uh, thank you. So this is, is related to the um, local assistance grant we recently received to do um, some study, uh, find more efficient ways to monitor grazing programs, essentially is what we're, we're looking at. The reason we reached out specifically to um, University of California was because they've been on, on their um, Blue, Blue Oak property up, uh, up by uh, Joseph Grant County Park. For a number of years, they've been doing a lot of work like this on the property. Um, so they have a pretty good baseline of, of existing information out there. We're hoping to sort of leverage that existing information and tie into that um, a little bit. So that's one, that's why we specifically reached out to them. Um, County Parks, uh, you know, for a long time has, has been um, involved in grazing and been interested in grazing monitoring. They're do, trying to do more of that, but they are always strapped staff-wise to, to do that kind of monitoring. So they're really interested in the efficiencies that might be gained from this kind of work. Now, um, one thing to recognize is that we put those two names in the grant application, um, but there's certainly nothing to say that those would be, you know, that, that that's it. So um, the other thing that we are, will have to balance when we get the money in hand and start doing the work is it's $85,000 and we're, we're gonna have to think about how much um, field work we can actually do for that budget, which is relatively small when you start putting people out on the ground. So it's probably only gonna be you know, a couple of locations that we're monitoring. So Open Space Authority could certainly be part of that. Um, and as efforts like this happen over time, I mean, those are the kind of organizations that we'll be reaching out to. So there's nothing that to say it's just those two organizations, but we certainly will be conscious of how many sites we'll be monitoring. Hmm. Thank you, Troy. And uh, thank you, Doug. That closes the public portion on item 12, governing board members looking for a motion to adopt. So moved. I would like a staff report first. Oh. Thank you, Mayor Tate. So uh, the state requires that we adopt a resolution approving the filing of the application, even though we already filed the application. So this is kind of a perfunctionary. Yeah. Um, and also that you would grant uh, the executive officer the authority to, to accept the funds and, and, and be the grant manager. Um, the, uh, the agency was awarded the, the grant in in November of 2014. Just to let you know, we, uh, we're we providing a 10% cash match to this grant and we also have um, administrative and services match. So there is a fiscal impact to the agency. And we also, uh, as Troy mentioned, levering the efforts of the Nature Conservancy and cooperating landowners, which amounts to um, a 28,000 uh, cash match. So the total project with the in-kind matches is um, $127,199. Motion for you to Come accept in. the money. Correct. We have a motion. Need a second? Second. Second, any discussion? None. All in favor on the governing board say aye. 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 Opposed, none. Take, take the money. <laughs> governing board members, meeting adjourned. Thank you, Mr. President. You are welcome. Drive carefully. Implementation board members, Stay tuned. We now move on to item number 13, which is approval of the minutes. Second. And Valerie, without, Jason was not here for that either. Chair, I will also be abstaining from. Correct. Let me just check, because you can vote on it even though you weren't here. So let me just check with Valerie if we need your vote or not to pass this. It won't pass without a unanimous vote. If need be, I have reviewed the minutes and can and act if need to be. Thank you. You're my favorite Jason here. This is good. I, re I, I removed my previous statement of abstaining from, from vote. Thank you. Taking one for the team. All right. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I second it. Thank you. Lazat and Herrera. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you again, Jason, just so we can get that done. Uh, we now move on to item 14, which we discussed before but did not vote on before. And um, what was discussed was Wasserman remaining as chair, Lazat as vice chair. Someone. Someone. <laughs> Thank you for the motion. Thank you for the second. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Any further you. discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed, none. Thank you very much. Confidence. And thank you. Thank you for stepping up. Member Lazada, absolutely. That concludes item 14, Angie.
Uh, 15 is to for the implementation board to review and accept the fiscal year report Edmund yes it's just to review and accept the, the budget schedule which is attached there's one error there for the attachments there is no resolution it's just to review and accept the budget schedule for uh, fiscal year 1560 without an attachment you said yeah uh, with with an attachment sorry there's there's listed here two attachments. There's only one, one. budget schedule. There, uh, uh, no uh, no resolution is needed. Okay. So we need a motion Somebody to accept. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Pa opposed none. That passes unanimously. Item 16 was handled earlier. Angie, that was approved unanimously as well. Item 17 is an action item. Edmund, we're going back. Um, and Troy touched on this with the Don Edwards. What do we have here? Adopt, oh, adopt a resolution. Yes. Do, yes, adopt a resolution authorizing $178,171 to be spent on a, uh, to, to go towards a five-year agreement between the agency and San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory to manage Western Burring Owl at the Don Edwards Wildlife Reserve Warm Springs Unit. Uh, as Troy noted, the agency is undertaking a series of measures aimed at reversing the decline of burrowing owl in the South Bay region. Management agreements with outside organizations who are protecting burrowing owl nesting habitat is critical for plan success and is a key tier one, tier two implementation strategy. Thank you. Uh, question, Jason, please. Thank you. I would just like to put this out to staff for consideration that as you continue this, as you start this work with the agency, to have them be able to come back in front of the implementation board and also the governing board to provide us with updates as to how the management of actually those lands are going and to be able to share with us what they're seeing as potential recommendations to be able to improve uh, their, their process and what they're undertaking. Absolutely. Thank you and um, I apologize. The the Don Edwards Wildlife Refuge Warm Springs Unit was, oh, I guess I'll ask Troy, on, on your map, was this outside of Santa Clara County? Yes. This was in Fremont in Alameda County. And these are funds going to that organization outside of our county and outside of the plan. So as far as our plan, as far as budget, um, is, is this in there? I don't recall anything it, like It's this. part of that extended uh, area that Troy referred to. I, I understand yeah. that, but yeah. it's your understanding, I'll ask Valerie as well, that, well, I guess Valerie will say if we vote on the money being spent there, the money can be spent there. So, and, and I understand it's a wonderful thing to do and it ties in with our mission with the Burying Owls. I just wanted to make sure this type of expenditure was in our budget or is certainly in our current revised budget. Yes. Yes, the and uh, with the uh, weepy with the uh, sewage treatment plan in the city and those non-participating cities that Troy alluded to will will be. Um, I've already met with uh, the city uh, environmental utilities group to talk about doing um, a management agreement with them uh, out at the. So yes, this uh, this was an agreement with this organization was envisioned within the Burling Owl uh, strategy and yes, there is money in the budget for it. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, and, just, and just to clarify on that point, this is helping to offset potential impacts or, or concerns within our, our permitting area, right? So, so the development that's occurring within the plan area within our co permitting jurisdictions is being addressed through this sort of off, uh, to misuse the term probably offsite mitigation Correct, correct, right. Andrew. Yes, and ba basically, um, we're hoping by increasing the population of the birds in places like Warm Springs that they'll decide at some point in the future to set up uh, residence in South County, <laughs> and that may have there's there's something called Tier Three, which the I'll just give you a heads up on it. We're probably going to be uh, in uh, tier three next year. The states wants us to be in tier three now. Uh, we're, we, uh, we said before we go to tier three, which is like DEFCON five for the birds, 
we, we have to come up with a plan of attack for that. So translocation of the birds is one of the strategies envisioned in tier three. Um, it's Boeing owls haven't been haven't done well when they're translocated to another site, so it's 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 something we don't take lightly. So. Thank you. But Santa Clara County is special. People do well when they transfer here. Yes, it's exactly. Helpful. And and we'll try to get some of the San Benito birds that come up too. There you go. The the, the reason I was asking the fellow board members, committee members, is the, the report that Troy gives us. It's, it's annual, correct? That we've contracted with. This agency is contracted to get an annual report from this consultant, this information regarding, and the Habitat Conservation Agency is paying for that annual report and, and research and all that, that you did, and I appreciate your presentation today. If another agency, another county, another city, another um, habitat plan, I, I'm just kind of looking at this as us doing work outside of our area, and then we're sending money outside of our area, and we're providing, we're paying for a consultant to count burrowing owls outside of our area. I'm kind of looking for money coming from outside our area to say thank you for the information you're giving us. And for me, I'll just pick Alameda County, if Alameda County is getting information that Troy has gathered, as you showed on your map, your stars outside of the uh, habitat plan, that's a benefit to Alameda. Instead of us giving them 178,000, it seems they should be giving us 178,000. So I'm just trying to, to understand what we're doing. Yes, and we sent letters out to all the non-participating cities, including Fremont, saying, hello, we exist in burling owls. So, so we, we touched upon all the species, but we're most concerned about burling owls and nitrogen. Those are the two big issues that impact our plan area by activities that go outside the plan area. So, um, we will be commenting on their CEQA documents. So if a project comes up in Fremont and it, we, we think it might impact the burrowing owls at warm, warm Springs, we will comment on that project. And hopefully uh, through the CEQA process and through collaboration with the state and the environmental community, we, we will be able to do, do as you described. And I'm hoping that the some of those big projects in Santa Clara, the city of Santa Clara, that we'll be able to uh, encourage them to mitigate their burrowing owl impacts through, uh, through the plan. My, my suggestion, excuse me one second, Andrew. My, my suggestion is you meet with other people who share your responsibilities, habitat preservation throughout different cities and counties, um, is letting them know that we paying a consultant gathering information in their area, mm. and if they want to help contribute to that effort, we're happy to share information. Sure. I, uh, that's a good idea. No, okay. we, 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 we haven't done that yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems we're giving them info and money. Yes. So I'm not sure on this one. Yeah. Well, and sort of along that lines, I, you know, I, I don't know, maybe this is a question for council. Is there a, a potential that uh, a project in Santa Clara or, or Fremont that might have had a burrowing owl impact would say that their impact is being mitigated by this work that's being done um, through our agency? Um, without participating, right? Without, without sort of contributing to that work, but just say, you know, this work that's going on would uh, take care of impacts of the project. I'm sure that they can try to say that. I don't think that um, it counts from a CEQA standpoint unless they cough up some money. And maybe that's something that, that if, if we're commenting on projects that we could be aware of at least as we, we do so. There were a couple projects in Mountain View that were doing that very, making that claim with nitrogen. I've written letters to both of them saying that the plan only mitigates for plan area impacts. So if you look at nitrogen deposition, uh, the plan area contributes to roughly 50, 54% of the nitrogen that will drop uh, in the habitat areas uh, so the, it, within the plan area. It's it's in the mid 20s that comes from non-participating cities, and then the rest comes from China, San Francisco, wherever. So they cannot make that claim because we're only mitigating nitrogen for impact. We're we're only mitigating for nitrogen that we uh, create. So they they are making that claim on nitrogen. We've countered it. Um, 
it's whether I guess the question I'll pose and this is maybe not a fair one to the implementation board but if we want to seek legal action with some of these cities that are making these claims that I would I would defer to your uh, um, recommendations on that and it's something we don't have to decide upon today right. but that but but that would be the next step if they continue to make that claim at least with nitrogen no one's made it yet with burrowing owls but we'll we'll find out thank you member Herrera. So what we're saying is these these cities are making a claim that um, the what we're, the activities we're doing mitigate their they're not 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 quite that uh, overtly it's more covert by saying uh, that they don't have to mitigate for nitrogen because because we're doing that yeah. yeah they don't have to yeah mitigate. yeah so can we I mean is some of our activity that we would be doing I mean can we can can they pay us uh, so that what we're doing then does mitigate or is that appropriate? I mean, so we yes. could, you know, we can be that agency that they go to so that we, you know, it works for us and it works for them. It it's happened um, in with Apple, Intuit, uh, JPAR, and a project in Gilroy, the, that warehouse project that they gave five thousand dollars, even though they were a project that got all their permits prior to the plan existing. <laughs> or there might have been a pipeline project, the one in Gilroy. So is there a way for us to be in at the beginning so they kind of know before this happens where they're, where they're sort of passively letting it look like we're mitigating? I mean, is there some so, way So that's why we sent them all a letter. We sent letters to all of the community development department heads to say, hey, we're here. This is what um, our purview is uh, we have these issues and concerns we have these species and particularly we're concerned about the burrowing owls and the nitrogen deposition and you need to include us as a body that reviews uh, CEQA documents for any projects that might impact any of those things and is that is that all we need to say in terms of what we can offer them or do we need to do additional things that might be a little more in terms of marketing our services to them? Well, I'm sure we can do other things to probably market our services, but we... we I'm, I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but... Legal... And, and I, th I think that's a good question, but we've realized that they didn't even know we exists. were there. Exactly. So we wanted to make sure they all knew we were there. Hmm? <coughs> Great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but, it, but in the case where they put into a... There's, environmental document that our plan is mitigating the impacts. They're aware of us. Um, we've submitted a comment letter. Did they respond in a, in a way that you found satisfactory to the comment letter or was there not at that point yet? Or? We, um, we haven't gotten any direct responses on the, the one Mountain View. It was that uh, Bay Area Precision Plan. Um, Santa Clara did respond, the city of Santa Clara, in, in their NOP. Um, we, we commented on the city of San Jose Heritage Oaks project and they did comment. So we, 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 we are, they, they don't, some, sometimes they ignore our, um, it's, it's one of the challenges with CEQA and uh, we're, we're trying to stay on top of the issue and uh, Fremont is what just regi registered us on their uh, notice. Mountain View is now sending us everything, even on tree permits. And um, Newark is going to be sending us stuff. We, I haven't gotten any other um, response from the, from the other communities. Huh. Uh, I'm sure it's a, um, some probably say, who the heck are these upstarts telling us? And, and others are saying, okay, sure, you, you guys are a new player, We're, we, we understand that. Uh, as, as CEQA leads, they, they, can say, uh, they can say what they said in Mountain View. Right. And then if, if we want to challenge that, um, we'll, we'll, we'd have to sue them or challenge it legally, I'm assuming. And maybe a interim step would be to put out some sort of report card of like, here, here's how other jurisdictions have responded or participated or not. I think that's a good idea. Thank you. All, all very helpful. Um, 
Item 17, and the uh, recommended action is to adopt the resolution. So I'll look for a motion to do so if there's no further discussion. So moved. Thank you. We have a motion. Second. Moved. I've got a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously, Angie, from the uh, implementation board members here today. And Valerie, we are now, or I'll say Edmund, are we adjourning to closed session? Are we relocating in another room? And we do have op um, opportunity for public comment. So what is your plan? Yes, we were going to relocate to another room. Yes. Okay, so Valerie, can I take public comment here since I have the public here? So the process should be that uh, you would take public comment if anyone has any on the item that is scheduled for closed session. You would then go into closed session. And then you need at least the chair or somebody needs to come out of closed session and, and make the post-closed session announcement on the record. Thank you. And as far as the public comment of the closed session agendized item, is there also public comment for anything not on the agenda? It can be. Typically, uh, t typically for a closed session, it's just on the closed session item, um, but you can certainly entertain other comments if you wish. Well, I will turn to the public that's here and ask if anyone wishes to speak. Doug, I see you do. Excuse me just one second. Does anybody else wish to speak? No, Doug? Thank you very much. It's like you're, you're Walter's brother. All right. Let's have a report from our chair, please. Thank you. Could you could Hold on a minute. We need to get public could records. Could you speak you in the microphone, microphone from Angie? Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Walt Klein, Gilroy. I am chairman of the Citizens Advisory uh, Committee, and uh, at our last meeting, we did hear parts of the Burrowing Owl report, and that was the highlight of our meeting, as I'm sure that that was the highlight of your meeting today, and uh, so, and that's my report. You are my, my favorite report giver today. This is good. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so our... Implementation Governing Board meetings are adjourned. We are now in closed session. And we can get up and move to another room, I guess is the best thing to do, rather than clearing the, this room? Yes. OK. So don't take it personal, anyone. Have a good night. Come back out here and report out the only item. Review?